All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jalen Vasquez. I am the community manager and events coordinator here for Freelancers Union and Freelancers Hub. Hope everyone's having a very lovely day on this Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday, yep, Tuesday. Um, we have a very uh, excited event for you today about freelance taxes. Um, Thank you all for joining. Uh, this event is being recorded and should be, be streaming on YouTube. We kindly ask everyone to mute themselves, if not done so already, just to minimize any extra background noise. And before we do kick off this event, I do have some news, which is very, uh, we're very happy to share with you. So we're excited to announce our brand new partnership with Tax Act. They're an online tax filing software that's super easy to use for freelancers and self-employed individuals. Their deduction uh, maximizer helps you get the most from your freelance business with different pro tips to help you understand everything you need to need uh, in all those crazy tax forms and everything you need to worry about. A unique feature um, that once filed, you'll receive a personalized tax plan to set up for your success and your savings uh, in the upcoming year. And if you hit a speed bump at any point, uh, you can also add help from a real life tax pro. We do have an exclusive partnership with Tax Act that gives all of our members of Freelancers Union 25% off both federal and state filing costs, as well as off the cost of their expert help add-on if you go that route. And they make it very easy for you to import all your info from previous tax years if you filed using a different service like TurboTax. Uh, we do have a special link that I'll add in the chat below so you can use your discount offer. Um, if you do have any questions throughout this uh, webinar session, feel free to write them down in the chat and we'll try to get to them when we can. And I will hand over uh, pretty much the presentation now to Curtis and his leadership and the leadership of the Tax Act team. Thank you, Jalen. Uh, and uh, folks, we're super happy to be here. My name is Curtis Campbell. I'm the president of Tax Act. We are one of the largest providers of online tax services in the United States. And we've been doing this for, remind me, Mark, this is well over like two decades now. So we've been doing this for, for quite a while. Uh, but let me also introduce Mark Yeager. You wanna give a quick intro, Mark? Yeah, thanks, Curtis. My name is Mark Yeager. I am the Vice President of Tax Operations at Tax Act. Uh, so a lot of my, my team members do, uh, they really handle updating the tax software on uh, the latest code from the IRS and state changes every year. Awesome, thank you. So Mark's got a army of accountants that work underneath him, really trying to understand all the tax law changes that happen both at the federal and state level. So he is like a walking encyclopedia of tax knowledge. So uh, Mark, thanks for joining me in this. Uh, and I, I'd like to jump in just talking about the freelance space. And before I do that, I, I know we hear about this quite a bit, but you know the world has changed incredibly over the last 15 months in every sector, uh, everybody to some extent has been impacted. And when you think about just folks that have, or just traditional W-2 employees, a lot of those folks have been impacted because potentially they may have lost their jobs. When you look at the unemployment compensation that's gone out from the government, these are some of the highest levels that we've seen in a really, really long time. So even for some of the W-2 workers, it's forced them to, sort of reconsider alternative streams of revenue, and in some cases has forced them to become freelancers. Um, I think if you look across the United States, there's probably over 60 million people that could be categorized as freelancers. It's incredible how fast that sector is growing. So, you know, thank you all for being a part of that. It's one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy right now. And it's not without its challenges. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time with you know, accountants who are preparing taxes, freelancers, medium business owners. Uh, like I said, we've been doing this for over 21 years now. Uh, and taxes is a topic that, you know, I joke around with Mark and my leadership team. It's kind of like within the big three of things that people dislike. So within the big three, you've got your typical going to the dentist. Nobody likes that. You've got going to the DMV, especially if you live in Texas, you don't want to go to the DMV. And you've got the ever, ever like formidable mother-in-law visiting for 90 days plus. Those are typically not great things. And taxes fit into that category as well. 
So a big part of what we do at Tax Act is we try to make doing taxes simple, right? Because, you know, we can't expect everybody to be a Mark Yeager. So that's a big deal for us. Um, so Mark, when you think about things that folks should think about that are freelancers, and that sometimes they may be new to this, are there a couple of things that come to mind? Yeah, I, you know, I think the first thing when you, when you think to hear uh, the word freelancer is just empowerment. Right. I think that's one of the first, first things I like to always mention is that you get that feeling of empowerment that, hey, you know, Curtis Campbell's my boss. I'm an employee for Tax Act. Curtis gets to boss me around every single day. Right? That, that's just part of being an employee and, and having to report into Curtis. But as a freelancer, you know, you really get to set your schedule. You know, you really get to take on the projects that you want to take on. So there's a bit there's a good sense of uh, empowerment uh, as it relates to being that freelancer. Now, with that freelancer, it, it's really you're really what you consider an independent contractor uh, in the eyes of the IRS. You're that person who you know, obviously work for yourselves, but in the eyes of the IRS, uh, you're actually what you may call a self-employed uh, individual. And as being as that self-employed individual, uh, there, there's really some different reporting and some different forms and things like that that you have to actually own uh, for purposes of, of being that freelancer and, and what you need to do to meet your tax obligations for the year. Got it. What are some things that people that are new to being a freelancer might not traditionally think about? So most people that are listening have probably done their taxes at some point in time. Um, a lot of people have probably done them online, hopefully using Tax Act, but you know, other solutions would be TurboTax and H&R Block. And they might be used to the traditional, I'm going to get my W-2 in the mail around that third week of January. And that sort of gives me the indication that it's tax season again, and I'm either going to go online and try to get my taxes done, or I'm gonna go meet with an accountant. Um, and they're always kind of thinking about taxes as, you know, you know, as a, in some cases, a big bonus that they'll get later on in the year. But what are some things that might surprise people that have been doing that, but have switched to become a, a freelancer? Yeah, it, it's one of those that, you know, a lot of people are thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, I may be a business owner, I may not be a business owner. Uh, you don't have to file a whole new different type of tax return, right? You file a Form 1040 each year if you're if you're an employee. You still file that Form 1040. Uh, there's just an additional uh, form called a Schedule C that you really have to file uh, to report that uh, the, the income as a freelancer and your expenses as a freelancer. So one of the new things, especially, is this Form 1099-NEC, uh, non-employee compensation is what that NEC stands for. So that I would say is going to be one of the new things, especially for those new to freelancing. Uh, it's going to be new for you that uh, the company that you contract with or you do the freelancer with will issue this form to you uh, with box in, with not a non-employee compensation reported in box one of that form. And really that should go out by the end of January, similar to getting the W-2. So while, yeah, you know, everybody's pretty familiar with that form W-2, the Form 1099 NEC is going to come around that same time period, and really it just reports different things uh, in regards to the income that you receive compared to the income you receive from an employee position. Got it. What about the quarterly tax payments? You know, sometimes people that are new hear about that. Um, is there anything that folks should be thinking about when it comes to quarterly tax payments, especially if it's a new thing for them? Yeah, if it's a new thing for you, you know, if, if it's something that... Uh, you're just starting to get mixed into it. You know, I still work uh, for a company like Tax Act, but I want to do some freelancing on the side. But typically, what, what my recommendation is, is that you typically don't have to worry about estimated quarterly tax payments because a lot of times you might have some uh, tax credits or deductions. You have the federal withholdings uh, that come out of your paychecks for that, uh, for that employee position that will help cover the freelance income that you receive. Um, now, on the flip side of that, if, oh, you want to go full into freelancing and, and I'm done uh, with the grind uh, of, of the employee position or working with the company as an employee, uh, that's going to be a difference. So, right. So as an as a employee, your employer withholds those taxes for you um, on a paycheck per paycheck basis, whether that's weekly, whether that's biweekly, whether that's monthly. Um, so some of the things that you're thinking about is federal income tax withholdings. Uh, if you're in a state that has state income taxes, you have state income tax withholdings. Uh, we're talking about social security taxes that come out of your paycheck, uh, Medicare taxes that come out of your paycheck. Uh, so some of the things that your employer does for you, as a freelancer, you now have to do on your own. 
Uh, so it's not a tall task or anything like that. But when we talk about quarterly estimated tax payments, that's mainly focused on those federal and state tax withholdings uh, that your employer may have done uh, for you as an employee. And then for Social Security and Medicare taxes, which is otherwise known as FICA taxes, if, if you didn't hear that term before, uh, that's going to be paid on a form called the, the Form uh, Schedule SE on your tax return to pay not only that 7.65% in Social Security and Medicare you would have paid as an employee, but since you're a freelancer, you now have to pay the other portion. So basically the other 7.65% of that uh, for a total payment of 15.3%. And, and remember, those taxes are really going towards your social security fund uh, when you go to retire someday, uh, as well as the Medicare fund uh, as well. So it sounds like, Mark, there's no free free ticket on this one. If you're a self-employed individual, you've got to pay into the system, just like the company would be paying into the system on your behalf. Can you talk a little bit about your know, traditional taxes for a W-2 employee and the there's like a retroactive nature of that? and then sort of the quarterly payments being sort of a future future type of situation. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Us? So for those that didn't know, the, the U.S. tax system is a pay-as-you-go system. Uh, and what the employer needs to do is they have to pay taxes uh, for those payroll taxes every quarter. That's just part of their requirement uh, as an employer with employees to make sure that that information uh, is passed on to the IRS. So they're collecting all those taxes because it's pay as you go before you go to file your tax return at the end of the year. So think about if I'm working from January 1st, 2021 as an employee through December 31st, 2021, all those taxes are being taken by your employer, ultimately passed on to the IRS and the state governments where they're collecting it. They get the money, they get to earn the interest on it. They get to spend some of that money on different project, government projects that are being worked on. Uh, and then you go to file your tax return the next quarter uh, or the next quarter and a half uh, between January and April of 2022. And that's when you do that reconciliation process that helps you determine whether you can get a refund or you actually didn't pay enough in and you owe more taxes. So as a freelancer, that same process happens. Uh, it's really, you don't have that employer phase there anymore that takes care of those uh, payroll taxes for you you have to take care of that on your own through these quarterly estimated tax payments. So in April, around, I think it's around April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and that's all in 2021. And then January 15th of 2022, you'll make those four quarter payments for your, for your federal and state taxes. So the IRS and the state agencies get that money. And then when you go to file your tax return in 2022, you actually have to remember to report that you paid those withholdings uh, to make sure that it's calculating that federal refund or, or state refund uh, properly year over year. Got it. Got it. Um, and you mentioned the forms. I know. I know folks here don't don't work in tax every day like we do. But just to repeat, what forms could they have gotten in the past? And are there is there like a new form that they may be getting this year? Can you just repeat that again for the the listeners? Yeah, so the IRS wanted to roll out a new form. Again, that was the form 1099-NEC uh, for this year. And it was specifically meant for freelancers like you all. Uh, it was really supposed to um, help ease the burden of trying to understand all the different boxes that were on this old form called Form 1099-MISC or M-I-S-C that used to report this non-employee compensation in box seven. So there's a whole bunch of boxes on this form 1099 MISC uh, that has like box one through 12. Uh, and it was really about just trying to simplify it. So for these freelancers, they can just get this new form 10 uh, form NEC with box one information. And that's all they have to worry about. They don't have to worry about what all these other boxes really meant. Uh, so that's really the new form uh, that changed year over year between the 1099 MISC and the form NEC. Another form that you might get that's probably a little less uh, heard of or, or you guys may not get it is this form 1099-K. It really deals with credit card transactions. So for instance, just a, a few different places like eBay, for instance, or, or Etsy or something along those lines. If you sell a lot of things uh, on, on these different uh, marketplaces or platforms and you're going and doing a bunch of credit card transactions out there, those places may issue you a 1099-K uh, simply to report the amount of credit card transactions you have uh, because they want to report that to the IRS as well. So if I'm a if I'm a freelancer, how should I be thinking about 
keeping track of everything that's going on. So I'm driving around, going from job to job. I've got expenses, paying for material. Are there things that I need to be considering uh, now that I'm a freelancer? Yeah, so one of the things being a freelancer is they allow uh, all sorts of expenses to be claimed. So, you know, one of the things I like to point out is this, is this what's ordinary and necessary business expenses. So, for instance, one of the things that a lot of people maybe don't think of would be like a cell phone bill, right? If, if, I'm, if I'm a contract writer and, and uh, USA Today or, or ABC News asked me to write a, an article on Form 1099-NEC, uh, I can go out there and, and they're talking to me, right? They, they, they need to talk to me in order to, to get a hold of me and have those conversations, or I need to have that cell phone uh, to have a conversation with Curtis Campbell to talk about Form 1099 or Form 1099 NEC. Uh, so just little things like that that are ordinary and necessary for your business, you really have to change your mindset that all this all this could be an expense for your freelance business. So. Again, other examples are your, your vehicle. Do you need to drive to the post office? If you have to pick up postage stamps, uh, obviously we talked about your cell phone bill, even your house, uh, your home office, things like that. Yeah, you have to kind of recondition your mind that anything you do for your business or for your freelance work, it's very possible that that can be deducted on your Schedule C and your tax return. Got it. You know, sometimes people think about shifting into freelance work as being complicated, right? So I've got to, you know, sub possibly submit my uh, taxes in a different way. I've got to, you know, prepay some of it. I've got to keep track of expenses. How complicated is it? And I think you mentioned somebody in your near family uh, may also be a freelancer. So you want to, you want to talk about that and things that they need to keep track of? Yeah, I actually helped file a tax return for somebody this past weekend uh, who's just new to freelancing uh, work as well. And I really had to talk through all those different expenses because. You know, we're talking about the, the mileage I mentioned and, and the, uh, the cell phone bill. And I kept rattling off all kinds of expenses for her. And I think she was pretty surprised and it kind of gave her a whole new light uh, of things that she needs to see herself in as it relates to the freelance work. But the most important tidbit I kind of gave her was you just have to be organized. Uh, once, you, once you kind of figure this out your first year, maybe it takes a couple of years, and you really understand how your freelance work flows, right? You, you kind of get into this rhythm of, hey, I have this expense come up or I'm kind of getting this, this income that comes up for the freelancer work. It's how do you best get organized to just keep track of that work? You know, some people, some people just take those receipts and put them in a shoebox and put them away. Uh, some people each day or each week may go through and start organizing those receipts into different categories like supplies or postage or different utility bills that I get for this business. Uh, so really getting organized is probably the hardest part that I've seen from freelancers um, in regards to whether they're new to it or, or even have been in freelance work for a while. And once you find that you get the organization down, the process of taking those receipts or those uh, expenses and putting them into your Schedule C filings, it actually becomes very simple year over year. So that, that's the main thing, Curtis, I'd say. It's just, it's the organization side of it. Uh, and that was most important for her. And, and, and we're going to get her on the right track for filing her taxes next year. Well, that's good, Mark. You know, I think in the United States, on average, there's about a little over 150 million people that do their taxes every year, which is a huge portion of the population here. And traditionally, about half of those people, they do it on their own, meaning they go online, use software to conduct their uh, tax return and about half of those seek assistance of a professional. You know, maybe Mark, you could talk about this, but you know, we've been around for well over two decades. And in the early days, taxes, even doing them online was fairly complicated. Um, can you talk a little bit about the transformation over the last 20 years and maybe a little bit about how simple it now is to do taxes online? Yeah, I mean, even yeah, 20 years ago, uh, online wasn't really around. There wasn't even an online software program really around. You really got this CD uh, that came in the mail and you maybe kept getting CDs in the mail for every time an update to the tax software needed to keep happening. Uh, so just these, these software, whether it's the, on your computer, on your, on your desktop machine 20 years ago, or now a lot of people just have laptops and they can now just log into an online account and, and enter these expenses. So, so the main thing is just uh, accessibility and convenience uh, for individuals uh, in regards to 
uh, entering their expenses, uh, you know, through different Excel sheets and things like that, mm -hmm. and then be able to potentially, you know, pull that data directly in into the tax software nowadays has really made things simpler mm -hmm. uh, in regards to just streamlining your efficiencies for tax filing each year. You know, one of the things that uh, we do at Tax Act is we spend a lot of time with our users, so self-employed folks, individual consumers, and we just, you know, observe them in the process of them doing their taxes. And every year we learn more and more and more. And one of the things that we've always found to be incredibly important is to use the right language in the right context in software. So it's almost the way you should envision engaging with your softwares is almost like engaging with a person in a conversation. Right, that's, that's about the simplest that we can make it, right? Typically, historically, the software was written by, you know, a core army of accountants and it felt very accounting-like. I don't know if that's actually a word or not, but I'll use it. And like I said, over the years, we've learned to actually consumerize, that may not be a word either, but the experience to ensure that everybody can understand what's going on, because the simpler we can make taxes, I think the more confident the user is at the end outcome. That's always been important to us. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And you, and you think about what the IRS does. If, if anybody's had a chance to go out and read IRS instructions or publications, which I hope you don't have to do that, but that, that's, the, that's the type of language that Curtis is talking about. It's really trying to humanize uh, that language to make sense uh, really to everyday people, even including myself, who's been doing accounting uh, work for a long time. Uh, so it's really trying to make it simple uh, in plain, talks, plain talk taxes language for everybody. You might be one of the few people that actually enjoys going through the IRS website, reading through every publication. You don't, you don't take that away as like bedtime reading, do you? You know, I enjoy reading the bills that come out from Congress, the American Rescue Plan Act with the, uh, yeah. you know, the unemployment changes and the stimulus changes and things like that. That's interesting reading, but no, no, not, not going back to the thousands of publications they have. I don't know if I get into that reading uh, very often anymore. Let's, let's do this because you, you, you brought up a couple of things. Yeah. You know, I'd love for us to talk to the, the folks here about the impact from COVID. And, you know, what are the things that they should be aware of on how it could have impacted them? You want to talk about a couple of things? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the main ones that actually was very recent, you know, this, this happened back around, I think March 17th is the time period that, that around this happened was the changes for unemployment compensation. And, and even this, uh, uh, third stimulus check that ultimately happened. Uh, so first, let's, let's just talk about unemployment uh, compensation, Curtis. Well, you know, we found that a lot of filers that filed either in January, February, early March went through, and, and we know a lot more people were on unemployment benefits this year. You really led into that real well to start this conversation, and, and really that information comes on a Form 1099-G uh, that's mentioned right here on the slide deck. Uh, but we know that certain freelancers actually did get unemployment benefits this last year as well. Um, so what changed in the middle of March is this new exclusion. So for folks who maybe filed in January, February, and early March, if they received, let's just say, $10,000 of unemployment benefits, they were taxed on their tax return on that income. But with this change in March, uh, they actually decided to exclude up to $10,200 in those unemployment benefits to be excluded uh, as income on your tax return. So if you're one of those folks who was in this position of, I've already filed and I did have unemployment benefits, you know, the IRS will is, is looking to ultimately uh, issue a refund of that difference so you don't need to file an amended return. But if you're one of the folks who haven't filed and, and waiting until this May 17th deadline to file, uh, that will be updated in, in, in obviously tax -X software, but other software as well. Uh, to ultimately go out and, and make sure you get that exclusion uh, during these during these difficult times of COVID-19. Yeah, yep, very good. You know, it's interesting. I, I think it's the right thing for the IRS to go ahead and exclude that $10,200. Now, once again, I, I wish they would have done it earlier in the tax season. Uh, now they're going to have to go back themselves and retroactively make the change. And what I hear you saying is that they're taking that action. So if you've already filed a return and you included unemployment as a part of your income for last year, there it sounds like there's no action that the folks here have to take around that. Is that right, Mark? That's right. For, for a vast majority of taxpayers, there is no action you need to do. There are some one-offs and some nuances that, uh, that the IRS does mention that 
You know, in some cases, your income could be lowered to a point that you qualify for a higher credit amount, like let's just say the earned income credit. The IRS can't figure that out, uh, at, at which point that you would need to file it in the men return for that situation. I guess my, my approach would be if you did file already, it's probably worth going back into your tax software and just understanding how your refund changed because of this exclusion. And if it seems it only changed because of the unemployment exclusion amount, if it's 10,200 or even less than that, then the IRS already here starting in May should start issuing you a refund for that difference automatically without you having to do anything. This is, this is really important. So let me just give an example. So say last year, I was a, a person that submitted my tax return and my income that was reported once I included my unemployment compensation was $60,000. I'm going to make that number up. Um, so it sounds like based on this new change by the IRS, they're going to exclude $10,000. Let's just make it easy. They're going to exclude $10,000. So now my reportable income goes from $60,000 to $50,000. And what I hear you saying is that the IRS is going to take care of that. And because my income went down, you know, more than likely I'm going to be eligible for a higher refund. So they're going to go ahead and fund that refund to me in the next X amount of, of weeks, for instance. But there could be something else that happened. So when my reportable income went down, I could now qualify for other, I'm going to call them other benefits. So I may need to take an action as a taxpayer to ensure that I am uh, not leaving any money on the table when it comes to those additional benefits. Is that right? That's absolutely right. And, and that's where you would want to file an amended return to get that benefit. Um, so even though the IRS is going to give you the benefit or the refund money for the unemployment exclusion, you have to take an action uh, to file an amended return to get the benefit of some other tax credit or deduction outside of the exclusion. Okay. So if you only walk away with a couple of things from uh, this session, please remember that because there's going to be a lot of people this year that leave a lot of money on the table. So please just remember the guidance that Mark gave us. Is there anything that Tax Act is doing for those folks who have already filed that could be in this situation? Yeah, there's, there's messaging going out. You know, when we're talking about social media, we have, we have uh, posts out on social. Uh, for those who have filed through us, we will have an email going out very soon um, to those letting you know if you have any action that you need to take or if you can just sit back and, and wait for the IRS to send you your, your refund check. Now, states are all a little bit different. You know, some states will do the same thing the IRS is doing, and some states will require you to do an amended return. Uh, we list that out in our FAQ page, and it'll be in that email as well, Curtis. Uh, mm -hmm. And just to remind folks, I know I'm using the word amended return. That is Form 1040X that needs to be filed uh, with the IRS. And, and the nice thing is, if you do need to file that amended return, the IRS does allow it to be e-filed now this year. Uh, so it should make it easier than having to print it out sign it and, and send it into the IRS when we know they're having some problems on their own uh, getting those, those paper returns processed this year. Got it, that's good. And you know, the other topic is similar to this, uh, an employment topic would be around stimulus and there's been multiple rounds of stimulus. Uh, and in fact, the latest data shows that there's $850 billion of stimulus that's been distributed by the government. So there's a lot of money that's out there in the economy. Um, as it applies to the folks that may be listening to us, are there any changes when it comes to child tax credit that they just may want to be aware of? Is there anything different that could be happening between now and the beginning of next tax season? Yeah, so there are some major changes to the child tax credit program as part of that American Rescue Plan Act uh, tax law changes that happened with this stimulus three check uh, here this last March. So for any of you uh, freelancers that have a child, you know, between the ages of, well, newborn uh, this year, uh, up through the 17 at the end of 2021, uh, they did decide to up the amount of that benefit, basically from $2,000 to $3,000. And they actually went up to $3,600 if you have a child under the age of six at the end of this, uh, at the end of this year, so, so December 31st, 2021. Uh, now, with that, one of the things they want to do is try to get that money into the hands of consumers and freelancers like yourself faster than you having to wait to file your tax return each year. Uh, so one of the things that uh, they're doing is creating these monthly payments uh, for the child tax credit amount. Uh, 
so they're looking to start that program, Curtis, in July. Um, so it is half the year. Uh, so for instance, let's just say you have one child who's 16 years old. Uh, so you may qualify for the $3,000 benefit, assuming you fall in the, in the proper thresholds of income. Uh, but let's just say it is $3,000. So you'll get $1,500 in monthly payments. So $1,500 uh, divided by six, right? It's the $250 payments you would get starting in July through December. And you would get the other half of the credit uh, on your tax return, on your 2021 tax return. So, so 250 times six, it's the $1,500 you'll get throughout July to December. And you'll get the other $1,500 credit on your, on your taxes. And it is one of those things that uh, I know in Congress, they're talking about trying to either make it permanent or extend it for another four or five years. Uh, but it does seem like a good way, Curtis, to at least get money into people's hands sooner than having to wait to get it on your taxes. Got it. Very good. So once again, please keep that in mind, right? So if you're eligible for the child tax credit, it's gonna be distributed, it sounds like, Mark, on a monthly basis, but you also should be looking for 50% of that in next year's tax return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there will be options for those that maybe would prefer to get it on their taxes. And maybe people just like getting a big refund. Like I, I, We all get that. Maybe they, they don't want it throughout the year, but they want that big bonus. They want that big refund check because they want to use it towards like a, a vacation or something like that. Uh, there will be some portal the IRS is creating for you to opt out. Uh, but as of today, it does sound like the IRS is going to opt everybody in to that monthly payment automatically. Good. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Let's let's flip over and let's talk about, you know, for people who are self-employed freelancers, are there things that they can do to maximize their deductions? What should they be thinking about? Yeah. So like we talked about a little bit earlier, it's expenses, expenses, expenses. So honestly, when you talk about those expenses, you should be thinking about everything that relates to your workflow for freelance work, and you should put everything under the microscope as to whether it's, it's deductible or not. Uh, so one of the things that we, uh, we already talked about earlier was cell phone bill, right? If, if you're using your cell phone at all for your freelance work, you should really think about that, that cell phone bill as being expense for your freelance work that you can write off of, of your income. Now, we talked about ordinary and necessary. One, one of the examples that I've heard before from, from one of my friends was, well, I have to put my dog in daycare uh, so I can do some of my work. Unfortunately, the IRS will not consider putting your dog in daycare as an ordinary and necessary expense. So while we do love our, we do love our animals, we do love our pets like our dogs, uh, unfortunately, uh, that is not going to be considered an ordinary and necessary expense for a, for a business expense. Uh, barring your freelance work is somehow not in, uh, in, in handling animals and, and things like that. So uh, and we always like to point that out just in case, but, but one of the big things is really just understanding your expenses, like postage, like your cell phone bill, um, like your vehicle uh, mileage and things like that that you do. The IRS gives a standard mileage rate each year for those miles. Uh, and just getting an understand of, of those types of expenses that you can claim on a year over year basis. Very good. So the, what you're telling me is there's not a lot of love for animals from the IRS, is that what it sounds like? Well, I don't know if the IRS would be happy if I said that, but uh, no, no, I mean, they just want to make sure that uh, expenses make sense for the freelance work that you're in. So if your freelance work is in writing or photography, chances are that those daycare expenses for, for your dog or a cat or whatever it may be will, will not qualify for an expense. Got it, that's, that's good to know. So, so know that, you know, Mark, has the privilege of spending quite a bit of time on committees at the IRS level. Yeah. And then I can spend quite a bit of time with other leaders in the tax industry working with the IRS commissioner. Uh, but I will remind him about the, the dog situation so that uh, hopefully we can get that taken care of in the future. Yeah. Any, any other things that we need to be thinking about as freelancers around deduction? So once again, expenses, you gotta keep a close eye on that. Anything else that'd be unusual for us to just be aware of? I, I think it comes down to tax planning then at that point, Curtis. If, if you get to the point where you're, you're doing really good, you, you're, you bought a new truck, and you think that, that makes sense to write that off uh, as a depreciation versus mileage, uh, or, or you have uh, a new printer that you need that you want to write off, things like that. Uh, once you get past that point and, and you start talking about tax planning, so, so here you are, you're making X number of dollars uh, from freelance work, you have these expenses, uh, but now it's like, oh, I'm paying, these, I'm paying all these taxes. And how can I keep reducing this? 
so then you really need to start thinking on a year over year basis, uh, are tax rates going to go up? You know, and obviously it's going to depend uh, who, who's, who's in charge uh, as president and, and who has control of the House and Senate. Uh, but it really comes down to game plan is our, our taxes going to go up, our taxes going to go down. Are there certain areas that are, are being allowed uh, in regards to um, different expense or, or, or uh, investment opportunities like a retirement plan um, that I can contribute more of my dollars to uh, that's going to be good for my long-term health, but it also gives me an advantage for my short-term tax strategy. So once you get through that process of thinking through expenses and, and you have that organization and you kind of get through maybe let's just say a year of just filing as a freelancer, then you really need to start thinking longer term in regards to how can I best maximize my dollars uh, to write off costs uh, for my freelance work. Um, you know, and I know one of the places that I've heard is California. You know, California does have this uh, LLC franchise tax fees that you pay each year. I think it's like $800. And those fees that you have to pay as being a freelancer, if there is something like that for you out there, that those will be deductible as well. Thanks, Mark. Hey, by the way, you're a tax machine, if, if no one's told you that before. Um, I think we're at that point where we're going to roll it over to Q&A, um, and we'd love to hear what's on your mind. And I do believe we had some questions that have been submitted. So I'm going to go ahead and um, just go ahead and test Mark's expertise with some of these questions. But um, if you're listening to us, feel free to go ahead and submit additional questions, and we'll try to get to them. Um, and I'm just going to read these directly as they've been written here. Um, first question, are you technically considered freelancer if a, if a single member LLC, what's the difference between sole proprietorship and LLC? Yeah. So it's just in kind of regards to what your protection uh, for liabilities are uh, from, you know, from being sued and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if you have that singer, single member LLC uh, designation, you would still file a schedule C. Uh, so ultimately, you could consider yourself a freelancer. Yes, that, that's absolutely true. We actually had one person uh, who worked at Tax Act, uh, nonetheless, who created his own LLC for helping us from a, from a tax uh, development standpoint. And he created an LLC as a freelancer, and, and we hired him uh, to do some work for us. So yes, that, that would absolutely be the case that you could still consider yourself a freelancer in that scenario. Got it. You know, what about um, state? So the second question we got was, can you talk about state tax filing requirements for freelancers that do virtual work for clients in other states? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So uh, the, hard, the, the interesting part about states is we, we have this term uh, internally that we call DOTS, just, just like the candy DOTS. And that, that acronym stands for depends on the state. Uh, so each state has different rules. There, there's actually a bill in Congress right now talking about multi-state tax filings and, and trying to make this simpler, especially in the COVID uh, case that we're in right now. But typically, it's going to depend on the state. So a state like New York uh, generally will say, if you do any work in our state at all, uh, then you have to file a tax return for that income in New York. Uh, but uh, again, there's, there's just certain requirements that that's probably hard to explain on this call that just different states have different requirements as to whether you need to file for that income in that state or not. Got it, got it. And, and maybe that has gotten more complicated with all the work from home, COVID remote things that are happening lately. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And that's what Congress is trying to clear up. They're trying to maybe put in some you know, 30 day, 60 day rules that, you know, if I work in New York less than 10 days, uh, but I'm really based in New Jersey, then, then I don't need to file a tax return in New York. I can just claim it all for, for new, my New Jersey tax return. I really hope they do that. I think it will make things uh, much simpler on, on everybody, especially you all as freelancers. Uh, but we'll see ultimately where that, where that bill goes. Got it. Uh, another question, Mark, that we got from the group here is the company I work for converted me from employee to individual uh, independent contractor halfway through the year. Are there any tax uh, impacts from that conversion of employee to uh, independent contractor? Yeah, so you're still going to get a W-2 for your work as an employee, uh, let's just say from January through June, uh, right? That, that, that's about halfway through the year. And at that point, your employer is going to issue you that 1099 NEC. 
-hmm. for the income earned from July through December. So the difference you have to keep in mind now is in January through June, they would have taken out your federal taxes. They would have taken out your state taxes. They would have withheld Social Security and Medicare taxes for you at that 7.65%. And your employer paid the other 7.65%. So now that you're an independent contractor, you are now responsible for making those federal and state payments quarterly, uh, like, like we mentioned earlier on this, on this call. Um, and then when you go to file your taxes at tax time, uh, for that period of July through December, you will pay this uh, self-employment tax, which is dealing with those Social Security, Medicare, FICA taxes on your tax return. So that, that's probably the biggest thing uh, people just have to remember to keep in mind is those, those FICA taxes, Social Security, Medicare, you start to pay on your tax return. So if you're used to a refund, let's just say in the $100 range, and you have some, in, you know, quite a bit of income that you're showing from this freelance work, you should expect to see some self-employed tax, self-employment taxes uh, that you may want to make a quarterly payment to help cover. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, we've got a few more questions. So the next one is, if I have an EIN and a business name for my freelance work, can I still file a Schedule C? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It would, it would be the same thing as if you didn't have an EIN or, or a business name or you didn't set up an LLC, a single member LLC for this. Uh, so my, my, my dad, for instance, has, a, uh, has his construction business. He has his name, uh, his construction business name. He has an EIN uh, and he still files his, his Schedule C each year uh, for, for the work he does in building homes. Got it. And, you know, probably the most popular question that we've got in the last 20 years of being in the tax business is, what are the chances of getting audited? And maybe I'm one of those people who puts all their dogs in the doggy daycare. Uh, how do I minimize those chances? Yeah, absolutely. So there are certain uh, expenses and deductions that are claimed um, that can help lead to a higher uh, audit rate. And, and when I say this, keep in mind that audits, for individuals, let's just say making less than a million dollars a year, are well less than 1% of those returns are get, get audited. So the, the, the audits that happen are very, very, very low and few and far in between. Where things may step up for the IRS to say, hey, something doesn't look right here. You know, on your Schedule C, you put a category. There, there's this business category code that you put in there that says, yes, this is for photography work. And then they, what they do is they kind of archive it or, or do this data batch to see, okay, if, if people are putting photography in here, how, uh, how similar are people's Schedule Cs that are photographers on a year-over-year -year basis? So they're, they're doing this statistical analysis that say, hey, generally a photographer claims $1,500 in um, supplies uh, and supply expenses for the year. And if, if your return somehow has something astronomically, uh, a huge outlier from that, from that mean, let's just say $20,000, that could lead to a higher risk of an audit. Uh, but even with that, uh, in that situation, it's still very, very like less than 1% uh, that you would still get audited in that situation. Uh, the other one is the business use of your home. Uh, they, they get a little more uh, stringent on that one. Uh, because of that, the IRS a few years ago did come out with this, uh, uh, standard, uh, basically a standard deduction for business use of your home. I think it's five dollars per square foot. Uh, so if you take that, they're they're much more lenient with it. They, they they trust that that's right compared to the individuals who claim out those expenses more as itemized uh, for the business use of your home. That's good. Uh, another question from the group here: uh, Do I have to receive an official 1099 form to report freelance income? or can I use bank statements to report income? Yeah, so typically you should, all, you should get your, the payor or the payer, whoever who uh, contracted you to do that work should issue you a 1099 NEC if you made $600 or more for the year. So let's just say you started in December and that you made $300. It's, it's very likely that that payer isn't issuing you a 1099 NEC this year because you didn't do more than $600 of work for them. With that, it does not mean that you still shouldn't report that income, right? You, you should still report that income. In that situation, you, you can use your bank statements for the income that you received from that payer uh, to report that income on your Schedule C. Good, good, okay. 
Um, we've got a few more. Uh, one request. Can you talk one more time about the difference between income tax and self-employment tax? Yeah, absolutely. So the income taxes uh, really are, are things that go to things like um, the military and, and uh, some different general road repair funds and things like that. And it's the income taxes. It's the taxes that you pay off of the income that you earn. And it goes towards different federal government needs. In regards to self-employment taxes like Social Security and Medicare, that's really going towards it's going to the Social Security and Medicare funds, which we know makes the news about whether it's going to run out or not run out in the long term. That's a whole nother story. But really, by you paying into for Social Security and Medicare, that helps drive, especially on the Social Security standpoint, what your benefit looks like when you go to retire or qualify to draw from Social Security someday. So it really it. it it all flows into the 1040 tax return, at least as a freelancer, it does. As an employee, it doesn't. It really just is the income taxes uh, for purposes of that refund. But the Social Security taxes specifically are going, are going into this fund that you should, in theory, be able to draw from uh, when you go to retire someday. Got it. Very good. We're going to take just a few more questions from the group here. Uh, the other one is one that we get quite a bit. Uh, I didn't receive my third stimulus check. How do I go about claiming this? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So if you haven't received the third stimulus check, uh, one, you got to ask us, did you file a 2020 tax return? If you didn't file a 2020 tax return or 2019 or tax return for that matter, you should go about doing that uh, because the IRS uses that 2020 tax return information to help determine uh, who gets that third stimulus check and when. So I think for a lot of those folks who did file a 2020 return, the stimulus checks have really gone out the door. Uh, it really comes down to then uh, at that point, uh, if, you, if you don't need to file a tax return and let's just say you're on social security, uh, the IRS is still going through a process weekly about every Friday uh, where they're issuing new uh, payments for folks that they just haven't gotten to yet. So one of the things I would say to do there is monitor sites like the IRS, they, they issue a press release typically weekly letting everybody know uh, what filers they're, they're sending out stimulus uh, free checks for uh, on a weekly basis or what type of folks are sending out those stimulus checks for on a weekly basis. Good. Uh, can you give the folks a reminder? So I know typically the filing deadline falls on traditionally about the same day and er month every year. What does it look like this year? This year has been an unusual year for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and last year as well, right? Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, we know last year the deadline got pushed back from April 15th to uh, July 15th. Uh, and this year, the IRS also made the change to move the deadline back typically from April 15th to May 17th. So they added one more month uh, in the mix there. Uh, so we, we have time. Today's May 4th. We, we know there's, there's 13 or so odd days left uh, to file your taxes. But uh, uh, if you're just getting organized now uh, or you still haven't uh, gotten those expenses uh, organized for the year, I'd strongly recommend to do that now. Uh, if you feel like you need more time, uh, that May 17th just isn't going to work, uh, I strongly recommend then that you file an extension uh, and pay an estimate of what you think you may owe for the year. That's good advice. Uh, you know, in, in all of our conversations with the IRS commissioner, he always advises consumers, get your taxes done go online, get your taxes done, or if you work with a pro, go get your taxes done, because that's how the IRS has your latest and greatest information. That's the fastest path to deliver that. So I would advise folks, um, if you haven't done your taxes, you should think about getting them done by the deadline. If you need to go on extension, make sure that you do that on time as well um, to avoid any payments associated with that. Um, the other thing for folks to keep in mind, and we talk about that quite a bit uh, in the industry, is just the workload that the IRS is having to get through this year. It's incredible, right? So if you think about the fact that last year was the longest tax season on record, once again, we've been doing this for over 20 years. It's the longest tax season we've ever seen. Um, and this tax season is also a longer than normal tax season. And the fact that the IRS is now in the middle of distribution of stimulus dollars and things like that, I think uh, we lost Curtis. We lost second. Curtis. Yeah. 
All right, we, we must have lost him for a quick second here. I'm sure he'll he'll jump off and jump back on. But yeah, he's what Curtis is saying is is, is absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's 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 very unique. It's very different for the IRS right now. For those that don't know, they've had a lot of funding pulled for them over the last eight to eight to twelve years. Uh, so when I talk about that, less than one percent of uh, folks get audited. They just don't have time to audit people. Uh, there, there there is. There is chances of them potentially saving uh, the government quite a bit of money if, if they were able to do it. I know there's a bill out there uh, that the Congress wants to give the IRS, I think it's about $80 million or $80 billion to, to pick up their enforcement on people making over a million dollars uh, a year. Uh, but nonetheless, they, they are strained. They've been asked to do a lot of things for these stimulus payments. Uh, they, they've been doing a pretty good job overall trying to get those payments out to individuals. There are bumps in the road anytime you try sending out 150 million uh, checks uh, to folks each year, but uh, uh, it, it is a strain for them. Uh, so that's, the hope is that you know, there's some patience involved. We know people want their refunds. Uh, if you do have a balance due, uh, they're, they're processing those checks uh, as they can if you need to, need to paper file it. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think they're doing what they can and they're trying to make some improvements, especially on the freelance side, because we, they, I, we've talked about it uh, with them, uh, how important the freelance side is, how many more people are getting in the freelance work. And it's really about making it easier for individuals to file without having to jump through all kinds of hoops to do so. Cool. Uh, do you want to take any more questions, Mark? I think we could probably do maybe one more question. Yeah, one more question works. Sure, let me see what we have. We have a couple good ones. Uh, okay, uh, this is a good one. With deducting expenses, are there certain ones that you deduct as a flat cost because you simply have to have it? For example, using uh, cell phone bills or depending on how much you use it for personal versus business use. So like things like cell phones, computers, uh, what's the best way to write that in your deductions? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to allocate those costs, right? If, if I'm making 30 minutes in phone calls a day for business related, but I have 60 minutes a day personal, uh, you're not required to break that out uh, separately in that situation. You would just claim your whole cell phone bill as a business expense. So even though you are using it personally, uh, you can still do it for the full amount for your business expense. The same sort of holds true for your vehicle expenses. Uh, the IRS does split it out between business mileage and personal miles and community miles. Uh, so really, you know, let's just say your home is your place of business. This is where I do my freelance work is at home. Anytime I travel from my house to the post office or my house to, uh, if things are okay, things are open back up, a meeting with a client that, that I want to talk about, that counts as business miles that you should be able to deduct. Uh, but if, if you're doing a personal trip, you can't really, you can't deduct those miles. So they, they don't really require you to break it out. They, they may from a, like, hey, I, I have bought this new truck or I bought this new car and I want to decide whether I want to depreciate this, this vehicle instead of claiming mileage over five years or if I want to write it off all at once. You do have the option to do that. That's the tax planning I was alluding to a, a little earlier in the call. Uh, but nonetheless, if, if, if there's, like a cell phone bill, it's typically you can write that all off, even if you're using some of it for personal. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Hey guys, for, uh, uh, oh, Curtis, I think we got Curtis back. Yep. Sorry, guys. Uh, I lost connection for a second, but uh, I think we're at that point where we'd love to wrap. Uh, let me just add a few things, and I apologize. I lost my connection for a second. Um, but once again, we're, we're always blessed to have uh, a multitude of tax experts, and they're all led by Mark Yeager. Uh, so thank you. Time. Um, I want to add just a couple more things for folks that are considering getting their largest providers of online tax preparation solutions. Mind, and then Jalen, I think we have a discount available to yes. the audience. Yes. So we do have a twenty-five percent discount, especially for freelance union members. I put the link in the chat now. And then also any questions that weren't answered, we're gonna collect them and just kind of curate them just to see uh, any common topics. And then we can probably do a blog post or something on our website, um, but definitely check out Tax Act. And thank you all again. Uh, Curtis, do you have anything else that you'd like to share at all? No, no. I mean, we, we, love, we love your group here. Freelancers are the engine that drives America and it will be for a long time. And it's really important for us to help simplify taxes as much as we can. 
So we'd love to engage with y'all. Uh, and then once again, have a wonderful year. It's going to be a, a crazy ride. So let's thank enjoy it. Yeah, thank you so much, Curtis. Thank you so much, Mark, and the rest of the Tax Act team. Hope everyone found this event very informative. Uh, we'll definitely be doing something like this again since taxes is something that nobody likes to do. There's so many questions involved and so many different nuances. Um, but hopefully you learned something today and definitely contact Tax Act if you have any questions and definitely take advantage of that discount code. Um, this event is recorded and will be uploaded onto YouTube uh, later, hopefully later today, if not by the end of this week. Uh, so if you did join late or you'd missed out some key information, don't sweat. You can rewatch this event at your own convenience. Thank you so much again, uh, everyone in TaxEv. Thank you all uh, for joining us, and we hope you have a very wonderful evening.